Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Forston. I am the vice president of the Aquinnah School Board. Our president, uh, Michelle Wall, could not be here this evening. She is not feeling well. Uh, with me at the table to my far left is one of my fellow school board members, uh, Ms. Toshiba Graham. And then in between the two of us is our superintendent, uh, Dr. Burroughs, Dr. Matt Burroughs. Uh, tonight we're here uh, as we do every spring before an, a school board election. Tonight we're here for a candidate forum. And our goal this evening is to kind of review what it is to be a school board member and all the fun things you get to do for no money. And, um, and then we will hear from our candidates. We will give them each a, a four minute uh, period to kind of describe themselves and describe why they're running and why we should vote for them. And then that'll be followed with questions uh, from the board. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let me say we've got uh, two uh, of our four candidates uh, here this evening, here at the uh, school board uh, chambers, if you will, we have uh, Candace Osino, Candace Osino. And then with us uh, via Zoom, I think we've got Brittany Murphy, right? Mumford, excuse me, Mumford. So thank you for joining us. Um, I understand that you had some scheduled vacation, so I'm glad that you could at least join us through Zoom. There are two others uh, who aren't here uh, at the moment. Um, we have uh, Tim Johns, who is running, and Norm Abrams, who is seeking re-election. Uh, neither of them are here at the moment, but we did say we'd start at 7 o'clock. Um, so with that, um, why don't we start, as we always do, our school board functions with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so... Um, those of you who are watching at home, uh, right now you can see on the screen we've got, it says Board of Education Candidate Forum, and we've just got a brief PowerPoint uh, to walk through that uh, will explain or review uh, the school board election process, what it means to be a school board member, and all that sort of good stuff. So, Steve, you want to go to the next slide? Do you have the, oh, you have the clicker? Click along. There we go. Okay, so um, every this the second Tuesday of every May is when there are school board elections. So that means the school board election will be Tuesday, May 14th. Um, the polls open at 7 a.m. and they close at 8 p.m. And there are seven polling places, Bunker Hill Elementary, Olive B. Loss, uh, this building, Marion uh, Profit Training Center, Townsend Elementary, Cedar Lane Elementary, Old State Elementary, and Middletown High School. Um, so I've, I've already given the names of the four candidates who are running, uh, Norm Abrams, Timothy Johns, Candace uh, Giacino, and Brittany Mumford. I'm going to keep clicking us along here. Matt. Oh, I'm, I'm my Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are not the AV assistant. Um, and just by way of reminder, and I think this is always a good thing that for us to all remind ourselves about, um, the school district has both a vision statement and a mission statement. Um, our vision is to provide a world-class education so that our students will contribute as leaders in a global society. And then our mission statement is to create an educational system where each student is engaged, supported, and successful. Um, we have a number of core values. First and foremost, our single uh, most important guiding principle or core value is to always do what is best for the students. And so you'll hear us say that a lot at school board meetings. And then flowing from that, we've got a, a number of other values. We hold a high expectation of excellence. We work to inspire trust. We always try to communicate with transparency. 
which is why you're watching, at least I hope some of you are watching this uh, via uh, YouTube. And we now, of course, do record all our meetings and broadcast them out on YouTube for those of you who can't make it here. So there's a lot of transparency. We act in a very fiscally responsible way, I think. Um, if you have seen any of our uh, referendum presentations or you've tuned in to some of our board meetings, um, you'll know that we spend the least per student uh, of any of the districts here in Newcastle County. Um, and yet I think we're getting really good results. And in fact, I think we might even be the best school district in Newcastle County. Um, we foster leadership at every level. We actively engage with our community. Um, we recognize others and we cultivate mutual respect for everybody. So those are our core values. First and foremost, we do what's best for the students. Um, and the district motto, the world is our campus and district beats is something you'll also uh, hear us refer to from time to time. Uh, collaboration and creativity, critical thinking um, and communication. And that's the way we engage uh, folks. Um, so to run for school board, of course, the filing deadline has now passed, but to run for school board, you need to be a citizen of the United States and live in the district. You have to be at least 18 years old uh, or older uh, when you're elected. Um, as I say, you have to live in the district. You cannot be a paid employee of the district and um, you cannot have been convicted of uh, embezzlement or fraud. Um, so tonight we're here for our candidate forum. As I said earlier, we're going to um, give each of our candidates four minutes uh, to speak. Um, other things to be a school board candidate, you have to pa pass a criminal background check and a child pr protection registry check. There's a couple of ground rules that we, we we're going to go over. Um, I don't think that they're all that surprising or shocking, but it's important that everybody know what the ground rules are. Um, there's no campaigning for school board in the schools and no candidate is to request that students or employees of the district contribute or work for their reelection. Um, although people obviously, you know, teachers and employees of the district can volunteer, you just can't ask them uh, to do it. Um, we do not allow for the distribution of campaign materials uh, on school board uh, on school district uh, property. We can't post signs on school district property, except starting at five o'clock the night before the election. You can put out yard signs and other signs. They have to be at least 50 feet from the entrance to the polling place if you're going to put out signs. Um, but only starting at five o'clock the night before the election. So if you put something out a week before the election, we're going to take it down, not because we don't like you, but because um, we're just not doing that until the night before the election. Um, moving on. Um, talked about the fact that campaign materials aren't to be distributed uh, in the schools, although if you rent, which you can do, you can rent a school room or a, a room for a campaign event or a campaign meeting, you could obviously bring in your materials to that meeting, but you know, don't then go around the halls and start uh, trying to hand them out or you know put up signs or stickers anywhere. Um, Political materials are also, I'll, I'll say, allowed to be used in, as classroom teaching aids in a nonpartisan way. That's really not an issue for uh, candidates. Uh, Middletown has its own rules about posting signs, um, and Del Dot also has rules about posting signs. You can't post signs along roads until it's 30 days before the election, and they have to be at least 10 feet off the edge of the pavement. So wherever the, the paving ends, you've got to go 10 feet beyond that. Otherwise, Del Dot's pretty ruthless and uh, they will come along and uh, pull your signs and um, then they'll send you a nice letter saying that you owe them, I think it's $50 a sign. It's some outrageous uh, sum. Uh, 
Oh, it's 100, they tell me. Yeah, it's gone up. So moral of the story, just don't get your signs pulled. Um, so now I want to shift focus a little bit. And Toshiba, feel free to join in if, if you want to emphasize something I'm saying. Um, and just talk about what the function is of the school board. There are five of us in Appaquinamic um, who are elected by the voters uh, as the kind of the board of directors, if you will, uh, for the school district. We each have a term of four years. Um, we do not get paid. It is all volunteer. Um, but it's important work, which is, I think, why you see people interested in wanting to do it. Um, and what are our primary responsibilities? Just like the board of directors for any company or corporation, the, the school board sets the vision, the goals for the district. Um, we adopt the policies and set the direction and priorities um, for the district. And then we monitor those goals. We monitor those priorities to make sure we're making progress. We hire and, and evaluate the superintendent. Um, we're also involved in hiring other administrators. Um, we oversee the finances. Um, so we adopt an, a, an annual budget. We monitor the budget as the year progresses to make sure we're still on target and on track and uh, things like that. And again, uh, if you've been watching our meetings for the last uh, couple months, you've seen that we had to cut the budget recently because when the referendum failed in December, that meant we were going to have a shortfall. And so we had to cut. That's, you can't spend money you don't have. Um, and then one of the other things we do, of course, is we um, negotiate and oversee the, the uh, contracts with our teachers and our other employees. Um, one second, going in the wrong direction. So question, what makes an effective school board member? Um, I think there's a lot of different ways you could go with the answer to this question. And I presume that uh, our candidates will tell them why they think they'll be an effective school board member. Um, you know, my own view is that you always get out of something what you put into it. And so, you know, when I show up at school board meetings, I have a notebook, which is all the materials that are going to be discussed at that particular meeting and all have gone through them before we get to the meeting. Um, you just have to be involved and be engaged. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to read that definition. We can go to the next slide. Or can we? I'm sorry. Is that the last one? No, there's more. Steven, I need your help. So here's just a, uh, a list of uh, some of the things that will help you if, if you're a school board member, if you're, or if you're the person selected. Um, you know, again, we're trying to set a vision for the district. We want to communicate with the community. Um, the five of us, I think, even though we're five separate individuals, I think we all listen to each other, we respect each other, and we work as a team, and we recognize that whatever decision the board makes, we're going to support that decision because you can't have uh, people pulling in different directions. Um, we adopt a fiscally sound district budget. Um, and, you know, I like to say we never forget that we're spending other people's money. Uh, sometimes I think in Dover, they forget that. Uh, and again, on this list, you'll see it probably should have been the top bullet point, but it's number five. We focus on what is best for students. That's always, always, always what we do. And then the last item on this, we advocate at the local and state level for public education, and that takes a lot of different forms. So sometimes we're down in Dover. Um, lobbying on legislation, lobbying for funding, changes in funding, changing in changes in funding formula. Um, our current board president, uh, Michelle Wall, um, was a big booster of a, a mid-year uh, unit count. And, uh, you know, ordinarily 
And historically, for years, your funding was from the state was set on the number of students you had enrolled on September 30 of the school year. Uh, and the fact that you continued to grow after September 30 didn't matter. You were still stuck with the money based on the number of kids you had on September 30. Uh, here in Appaquinimic, we continue to grow after September 30. We've gone up about what? Uh, 30, 40 students since the September 30 unit count in 2023. I think we're up closer to 85. 85, okay. So we, and so the good news is since there's now a second unit count that's done uh, at the end of January, we can get additional monies for at least some of those students who come in after September 30. Uh, it took many years uh, to get that legislation uh, passed. And there it is again. The primary goal is to focus on our kids and the success of our students. All right, so we're going to give um, candidates, as I say, a few minutes to speak. And that's where we are. So uh, let's, shall we just go alphabetical here? That means I've got to remember. Um, I'll just, yeah, Candace, that makes you first. So, Steve, can you put up like a four minute timer? Well, I'm indifferent. So, Brittany, do you want to go first? Okay, she's giving us a thumbs up. Is your speaker on? It is, yes. Can you guys okay. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Let me know when my time starts. All right, it has started. Um, good evening. My name is Brittany Mumford and I'm running for school board. Thank you to the school board members for organizing this event and having us all here this evening. Um, I am a variety of different things, but um, number one, not number one, but I'm a big wrestling fan. I'm actually the first female referee in the state of Delaware. And my dad and I go to the NCAA tournament every year. So I am zooming in from Kansas City, Missouri. I am not on a super warm, exciting vacation. I am watching a wrestling tournament. So I appreciate you all letting me join you um, remotely. I am running for school board for three main reasons. Uh, one, I think one is a, a refocus on improving math and literacy skills. Apoquinimic does lead the state, but uh, to be fair, that that's not saying much right now. We still are operating at about 48 um, percentage proficiency in English language arts and 40 in math. And I think some targeted ways that we can do that are ensuring that our teachers get access to the professional development programs that they need to incorporate the science of reading program. Science of reading is a curriculum that the state passed last year that's had really amazing results across the country and super excited um, for it to get to work in the state of Delaware. And additionally, some targeted tutoring programs as well. Um, secondly, I want uh, the school board to play a more active role as the state undergoes redefining or possibly implementing a new funding formula. I love that Mr. Furston brought that up. Our formula in the state of Delaware is from 1942. It's extremely outdated and it's based on what adults need to run the system, not on what our students need to learn. We need to break away um, from the unit count entirely and go to a resource or student focused system. Um, secondly, I'm a mom. I have a one-year-old who is going to go to schools within the Apoquinimic School District. I am a product of public education myself. I've seen the power that public education can have in people's lives, and I want it to continue to create possibilities for this generation and for future generations. I think we're we're falling short of what our kids need and we need a reset on what the priorities of the district and to be totally honest, the state are when it comes to education. In my day job, I work in education policy. I work with national researchers, um, national policy collaborators. And I also work in at the state level um, down in Dover advocating for improvements to the Delaware education system. So education is something that I'm very familiar with. It's something I'm very passionate about. And I will bring that passion to the school board as a, as a policy advocate and as a mom. Um, you can find out more about me on my Facebook page. Feel free to send me a message. 
I live right up by Port Penn. I'm happy to talk through any ideas, any concerns that you may have. I am a very transparent person. I'm an open book. I love meeting folks for coffee and having discussions. So please reach out and I hope to earn your vote on May 14th. All right, and you did it with 42 seconds to spare. So excellent, thank you. Um, Candace? Uh, just push it and then leave it right here. Yep. Okay, I guess my time starts now. Hi, um, I'm Candace Susino. I am running for school board, and there are a lot of key points, and um, I'm a very multifaceted, different kind of person. So first off, I've been in Delaware for 20 years. Um, we moved here in the year 2000 when our oldest daughter um, was one years old. Um, I was college bound, but then I decided to start a family and um, have my daughter first. That little girl from year 2000 when she was one is now 24 years old and just graduated from the University of Delaware. And so um, even though I've been a person who's always supported everyone, I feel like it was my time now that my daughter's older to kind of give back. Um, education is in my blood. Um, I am, come from an Afro-Latino family, Puerto Rican descent. Um, folks from my family went to New York, um, and then we've been in Delaware for all that time. Um, I am the daughter of teachers. Um, education is super important. It's not just about what you learn in the um, schoolroom, but also what you do at your home. I'm a big advocate in bringing education in everything that you do, whether you're, you know, walking with a preschooler and counting the steps as they go up or using as many words as possible so that you increase your child's vocabulary. And I feel like that's a perspective that needs to come into the school district. Somebody who um, who's raised a child with limited resources when I was younger. Um, me and my husband, we got married as, um, we're high school sweethearts. He's in the room with me. We'll be married 20 years. Um, and it's been a long road of, um, you know, working with very little to growing our career, taking care of our child. We were in our early 20s, then having our second daughter. Um, you know, she had some health issues when she was first born. And then also on top of all that, um, you know, breaking away from that cycle of poverty, mental health, and also um, learning disabilities. And so when I come to you, I come to you as someone who has lived life and has a huge journey in being someone who's self-reflective, self-learning, and always wanting to do better for my kids and for the kids that are all around me. And the biggest thing that I see in a lot of what we're doing and Apoquinemic does a great job, um, but I know we can do better in supporting kids who have learning disabilities. Um, I know that we can do better with kids who are just neurodivergent in general. And then also supporting mental health. I love the programs that Apoquinemic started doing with the monthly meetings and supporting parents in that way. And I would love to be able to grow that with using the resources that we have. I know we have I'm an AmeriCorps member from back in the day. I was a public ally and I know using our assets are super important. So just when I say that we wanna do stuff to bring more tutoring to school, to support parents, to help folks in mental health, I know that we can do that without spending extra dollars because we have resources and educated and wonderful people here in our district, whether they be parents or neighbors that can come and bring that support. And I would like to bring the assets we have and, en and enrich the students experience and give them those wraparound services so they can be successful. Um, and so this is why I'm running. Um, I'm someone who works at the University of Delaware and I see how education and how folks who have access to certain education can do better and some don't. And so I wanna feel, and I wanna create a systems where all students of all socioeconomic backgrounds can um, grow and make the best of their lives and do amazing things. And so that's why I'm running and I hope you would vote for me. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so I've got some questions that I thought I would throw out to Sheba. Do you have a question or two you want to yeah, ask? Yeah, I have some questions. I have questions from, from myself and also from our group president. So do you want to go first? Sure. I've got some questions from Nichelle DeWitt, who could not be here tonight. So I'll start with a question from her. Um, and 
to avoid being too long winded, because we, there are some questions that, you know, we could spend 20 minutes talking about and that would not be enough time to cover the topic. So we'll ask that you try to take no more than a minute to answer the question. But, you know, if you're in the middle of an answer and it's going to need a little more time, I'm not as strict as others are in uh, cutting people off. So question number one, and since we started with Ms. Mumford, um, why don't we start with you, Candace? What specific initiatives or changes do you believe are needed to enhance educational outcomes for students? Well, I'll, I'll be brief, but um, I mentioned this before when I was introducing myself, um, using the resources we have in our school. Um, I have um, friends who go, their children go to the district and, um, you know, single parents, um, and, you know, there's two households and sometimes it's not the easiest to support a student if they're not doing well in math or science. And then we have students in our Apoquinemic School District that have more, resource, more resources or are able to do better in math and science. And so why are we not taking those students and making study groups that and giving kids the opportunity to support each other? When my mom was teaching for 30 years in New York, she used to always teach in all the levels she could, whether it was in the classroom and then if she needed to support kids in a group, in a peer group. I mean, there's so many ways to help kids. And I feel like having kids help each other, whether it's one grade, you know, high schoolers helping middle schoolers or middle schoolers helping elementary school. I think if we made those more formal programming and we were able to support kids in that way, then then parents don't feel like they have to come out of their pocket for, um, you know, tutoring. I know as a mom, when I was young parent, I, you know, had to sacrifice time and effort and even my income to make sure that my daughter was hitting her marks in science and doing well. Um, but if we can, as a community, support each other and then those students who are doing better in one subject, whether it's math or science, maybe they're not doing as well in another subject and then they can support each other in that way. So formalizing tutoring groups and peer study groups, I think would be great at a lower level, whether in elementary or or in middle school okay. um, without using a lot of resources. All right, Brittany, I'll repeat the question. What specific initiatives or changes do you believe are needed to enhance educational outcomes for students? Um, so two and a half things. One thing is one and a half. So one, tutoring, yes, but specifically high dosage tutoring. It's been proven to be extremely effective all across the country. So frequent tutoring in small groups for our students um, that is led by an instructor. It has increased outcomes and helped students catch up after learning loss from COVID and summer programming. And these specifically for our most struggling or our lower performing students. Um, opportunity funding is something that the governor's office um, has mentioned they would like to see used for programs like tutoring or like high doses tutoring. And the state is actually forming a tutoring task force to figure out how the state can get more funds to districts to implement these types of programs. So specific and targeted programs like those. And additionally, uh, the school board being an active member in the change to the funding formula, one of the problems that we have is that students are, are low income, are multi-language learners, and our special education students do not receive targeted additional resources through our current funding formula. If we had a, a, a weighted student funding formula that focused on getting those students the specific resources that they need to learn, then we would see an improvement in student outcomes as well. Okay, great, thank you. Toshiba? Sure, so um, my first question is, is on behalf of our president and her question is, um, or more of the statement, first part. School board is a volunteer role. Have you volunteered with the school district before? And if yes, in what capacity? So Brittany, why don't you start this time? So no, I have not volunteered with the school district before. Uh, we recently moved to Middletown about a year and a half ago. I have a one-year-old and I was pregnant right before that. So those are my, those are kind of my excuses. Um, I am an active community member. I have volunteered in previous communities um, in a variety of different ways. I am active in the Delaware wrestling community as well. I volunteer at the Vista of the East every year. 
And I work political campaigns up and down the East Coast for free because I'm a crazy person, um, I guess. But I, 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 I apologize for not being a more active member of my Apoquindigment community more recently. Uh, that is not something that is indicative of who I am as a person or who I would be as a school board member. Thank you, Candice. Um, so I have volunteered in my daughter's school um, at dances, um, doing ticket sales, fundraising um, at the Black History Fair the last two years. Um, so I try to, as much as I can, support the school through Booster Club as well. Um, and then before we moved to the Apoquinimic School District, um, my daughter was at Charter School of Wilmington and we were living in Newark. And so whenever I could support, you know, in going to the school to support the kids in their activities, um, selling, you know, treats, I would try to do that as well. Um, and just being a support to kids in general. So if my daughter had, you know, kids who needed support, help, someone to talk to, just providing resources. And I'm a big advocate for volunteering. Um, the reason I'm even in this room is because of Public Allies. It's an AmeriCorps program that I did 20, um, 10 years ago, which led to my career um, working there now. And we learned all about the importance as an AmeriCorps member of giving back to your community in all these ways. So I continue to do that as my career and as a parent. Thank you. Um, have you been actively sharing the importance of the upcoming referendum with your friends and neighbors? And if so, how? Um, so me first. Um, yes, I have. So um, I voted in the last referendum in December. And right before, I looked up how you calculate it. And I had some friends kind of say, oh, I don't want my taxes raised. and And then... I think people were on not really understanding how to calculate it based on um, your a certain value of your home. Um, and I was explaining that to people that basically it's not as much as you think. And also look at all the safety issues that it would affect. Because I know for me, my daughter's in AGW Waters um, and having that space in the back of the school where the buses can can go would avoid so many things. Um, that is a very busy corner um, where um, the Cedar Lane campus is. And anytime there's any issues, accidents, whatever, it affects the whole street. Um, so if we can avoid less dangerous things on that corner so that the, the school buses can kind of have a space to go and students have a space to go, then we can avoid having everyone, whether they're a student or a parent or whoever, be affected by the traffic and get through 896. I think we can all agree that that would be helpful. Um, and so, you know, that is something that I kind of talk to my friends and family about. First of all, it's not that much, like do the right calculations correctly, here's how you find it. And also, hey, you know, you love you, you love kids you, and maybe your child's not in the district, but here's how it would affect me and my child and kind of giving people that perspective um, connects them to the to what's happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brittany, same question. So, yes, I have. Uh, I've added it to my personal Facebook page, my campaign Facebook page, and I've been knocking on doors the last two weeks and talking to folks about it at the door as well which has given me a, a unique opportunity to address some direct concerns, which has been mostly good, sometimes scary, if I'm being honest. Um, but for a lot of folks, it is a decent amount of money and they're really concerned about it and they wanna see the impact that their money is going to have, and they want to know why they should do it. So being able to have those really real conversations with folks one-on-one -on -one and best address those concerns has been, I think, beneficial for you know my attempt in helping to get the referendum passed, but also given me a look into you know what people want from their school board member and being able to be that liaison between the public and the school board and just making feel more making folks feel more comfortable about their vote in April. So. I've really enjoyed, I know it's kind of crazy to go through a school board election with a referendum looming at the same time, but I've really enjoyed that because of the, uni the unique perspective into what actually being a school board member would be like and the unique opportunity to connect with voters and people as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Richard. So I'm just going to 
throw out a question um, that maybe you would not have hopefully have anticipated. Um, you're starting to see articles kind of in the literature and the press suggesting yeah, that schools should not allow students to have smartphones during the school day. And so um, we'll start with Brittany. I mean, do you think that's a good idea, bad idea? Why or why not? I think it's a good idea and I think it's a bad idea. Um, I think that there is an opportunity to create restrictions on smartphone access during the school day that would potentially, you know, help limit students from being on phones during class which is a huge problem. But I think for parents, especially with the rise in certain types of violent activities at schools in the United States, being able to have that instant access to their children is something that's really important to them. And a lot of them would not react kindly to being told that students could not bring their devices into school. What I think we need to focus on, because one of the other main issues when it comes to devices in schools is cyberbullying and the things that students are actually doing on those phones and the things that we have access to, one of the things that we can do is make sure that we're over educating our children about how to act on the internet, the types of things they're looking up and just cyber. Um, I, I can't think of the right word right now. Like eth ethics is the word that's coming to me. It's not the word I want to use. Um, just how students should act when they are using their devices. I do not think that outlawing device usage at school entirely is the correct answer. Is this you know? Um, yes. Yeah, so I I'm feeling similar to Brittany in that that um, anytime you try to tell anyone in human nature that they can't have something, especially middle schoolers and high schoolers, if anyone is a parent of that, um, you will understand. It's not always um, something that you can really reinforce, and I think it would put undue pressure on. Um, administration and staff to kind of monitor, do you have it? Do you have your, you know, your phone or your device? Um, and so even with not a formal, like you can't have your device in school, I already know that that's become an issue and takes up a lot of teaching time. So I think the best way um, to deal with smartphones in the school is not to just ban them, but to, to continue to educate um, students and parents on the usage of that device. And then also kind of promoting, you know, and making things more exciting and fun. Sometimes um, as adults, we use our smartphones in meetings, right? Um, I know I've been to tons of conferences where they're like, okay, pull out your phone and go and do a survey. Everyone, let's see what everyone says, you know, their favorite ice cream is. And then you'll see a word bubble and you'll see chocolate and vanilla. And, you know, and so I think instead of, um, and I'm not saying the smartphone should replace or, you know, you know, books and learning and teaching. I think that's super important, but maybe finding ways to kind of implement it into the school while at the same time blocking out um, sites using, you know, the network so that they no, don't have access to things that are going to be too out of, out of what they're doing at school um, and so that they can focus in school. But I think it would be more of a distraction to tell um, kids and parents like they can't have their device because of safety and communication. Um, but there's a way to kind of merge it to involve it in school and then also kind of take it and segue to the lesson. So, okay. Go for both worlds. And I'm going to ask another question from uh, our board member, Michelle uh, DeWitt. And I guess we'll start with um, Ms. Orsino. How would you address issues of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion within our district? Um, can um, Michelle elaborate a little bit? Um, did she say a little bit more about? No, I mean, I mean that, that's how she put it. So I mean, she couldn't okay. be here tonight. But how would you address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion within our district? So there's a lot of directions you can go on. That. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is actually super important to me. Um, you know, um, the work that I do in public allies is, you know, it, my full time job is to. Um, give people a voice um, who necessarily wouldn't have a voice in the nonprofit sector by giving them a, an apprenticeship. Um, and we 
you know, are very big on diversity and inclusion, and I live it and work it and work it every day and teach it every day. Um, but when it comes to students, I think the biggest thing is giving students context of and and you do that through history and education. So, you know, I take as a parent every opportunity to talk to my daughter about her history. You know, I am um, of Puerto Rican descent and also uh, my dad is African American. So I have both stories of uh, people of African descent in Puerto Rico. I talk to her about, you know, stories of family, of coming to the US and how hard that was for my grandmother when she first came and language barriers to my dad being um, a seventh generation African American in the United States and how um, his family in the South migrated to the north and that whole story. And so I think how you create um, diversity and inclusion is showing folks how we all have things in common. You know, no matter what, you know, race or ethnicity you are, what language you speak, we all want the best for our kids. We all have these amazing, crazy stories that show perseverance. And um, if you teach kids these his, this history and this context of the folks of, of Delaware, the folks of the United States and how we've all overcome, um, then that is a great way to get students to kind of understand like, oh, so that's the context of why these things happen. Is that, that's why we have HBCUs and Dell State is there because, you know, um, schools weren't always integrated and students needed a place to go if they wanted to go to high school and beyond. And then there is more of an understanding of why um, that diversity inclusion is important because we're still building on, um, the very complicated history that the United States has had. And, you know, specifically Delaware, I know that schools didn't integrate here until 1981. I mean, that I was born in 1981. That's not that long ago. It's only 43 years. Um, and so uh, I think all those, those contexts of knowing where we came from, how far we've come, and then the, the little stories of like, you know, our grandparents and how they've overcome um, in the context of education and the world um, and access, I think are all great ways to promote diversity and inclusion. Okay, thank you. For the record, we did it in great before 1981, but anyway, um, Ms. Mumford, do you want the question again? How oh, would I'm you- would... I'm okay. 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 Um, so at first, I just I want to echo everything that Candace said. Uh, she has such an amazing story. And I think, yes, telling our stories is a huge piece of it. Fun fact, schools in Delaware were never technically desegregated. Housing was was segregated. And that's what caused our schooling to be segregated. It's just a fun fact about the court case. But um, so, yes, telling our stories, sharing the actual real history of the United States is extremely important. The state went a long way with um, House Bill 198 that required the teaching of African-American history, but it didn't provide a heck of a lot of context. And some districts have done a great job and some have done a really good job. So making sure that APO continues to, go, to do a good job in integrating <coughs> African-American history um, Latina history, LGBT history, the history of the history of all of the unique individuals that make up the APO district need to be a part of our curriculum. But then additionally, and this is where the school board um, can really play a bigger role, is uh, increasing diversity within our educator pool. One of the, the best ways that uh, children have, you know, learned that they can be anything they want to be is by seeing themselves in their teachers and in their administrators and making sure that we make it, um, we create diverse diversity, not in just our educator pool, but also diversity in the pathways that lead people to become educators so that working moms um, who don't have the time to get a regular four year bachelor's degree that are looking at potentially like night programming and different pathways to become educators have those opportunities and those access so that we're really seeing all different types of people within our school system in places of power. Um, and doing all of the great things so that our students can see that, you know, they can see themselves in the people that surround them. Okay, great. Thank you. Chiba. Yes. So both of you have spoke of tutoring. So that aside, um, what would be something, a unique program or initiative that you would um, pursue in an attempt to increase student engagement and enjoyment in learning? 
Do I have an unlimited budget in this scenario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is meant to be a little bit lighter than our questions so far. So you, you can pretend we have all the funds that, yeah. like, one of the and school districts in the has north has. And we have, we're all happy. So, yes. I love this world. <laughs> um, one of the things that I would like to see the school district do um, would actually be piloted after a program that is done in Denver public schools. I think it's called Den. I want to call say that it's called Denver Leaps, uh, and where they provided families. It was means tested, but they provided uh, families with let's say a thousand dollars that families could use for educational enhancement activities, not for tuition only for educational enhancement activities. So things like um, after school programming, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, soccer lessons. We know that kids learn a lot through athletics, painting, a variety of different programs to really enhance their experience and embrace the idea that learning does not happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen within the four walls of a school. There's a variety of different ways and paths that our students can take to learn and encouraging them, but really enable, enabling families to sneak seek out those opportunities. Okay. So, can you repeat the question one more time, please? Yeah. So, uh, tutoring aside, the high dosage tutoring that the both of you spoke of, what is uh, like an initiative that um, you would pursue in an attempt to increase student engagement and make learning fun? Um, money is, you know, no obstacle because we we're talking like successful referendum and all that yeah when life will be all good all right next month <laughs> i know right the referendum will pass for sure um so i think that um and this is totally um a, a little bit selfish but um i think more more um unconventional um sports programs Specifically, I'm thinking of um, like skateboarding and rollerblading and roller skating. Um, it would be so cool if we had a place where um, students could um, do that together and and come and compete and learn different. Um, just be able to express themselves in different ways um, other than the typical sports of soccer and and football but like because some students feel like okay i'm not the most athletic and but i do want to move my body and i do want to you know get involved in a team so if we could have an opportunity for students to do um, unconventional sports and other sports that are a little bit different and then um, be able to um, have a place for them to do that um, and then also provide you know food and snacks and all that for the students so that even if they don't have the money um, or the resources to, um, you know, go out and ha and have you know that that extra time, um, that you know, like you know, when you're going out and you're doing a club after school. I remember being a kid and being like, "Oh man, I don't have money for a snack, and there's no school lunch. So how am I going to eat?" Um, so that when uh, all these hours after school, I'm not starving. And when I get home, I have a headache and then I have to do schoolwork. So, you know, providing that dinner and snack and, and also staff to kind of support students in their mental health journey too. Because I think the biggest things that uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers need is just more support systems and more places that are more uh, unstructured, fun, with a little bit of structured activities. Um, so in a perfect world, they would have food, they'd have some staff and some folks to support them and some resources um, and just a place to kind of just lay it out and have a good time and get themselves Thank moving. Thank you. I've got one question I'm saving, I'm going to say for the end, but uh, do you have any other questions? No. All right. Well, so why don't we do this? Um, I'm going to ask a final question and then we'll give you each three minutes just to make a final uh, pitch to the voters, as they say. And my question, and so people are probably going to roll their eyes when I ask this, but whenever I interview people, I always like to ask them, what's your favorite movie and why? So I was going to ask the book. So. Candace. <laughs> so favorite movie or book? All right, favorite movie or book, right, I will we'll accept a friendly amendment. 
Okay. Oh my God, I love so many movies. So that one's a tough choice. Do I pick a musical? Do I pick a dramatic comedy? Um, if you pick my favorite movie, you get bonus points. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the one that comes to mind for me is Gladiator from the year 2000, Russell Crowe. Um, that's such a good movie. I didn't pick a musical, The Wiz. That was my second choice. But um, I love Gladiator because of the underdog story, um, someone who's been counted out um, that, you know, and, and also someone who may have achieved some things and then gets knocked down and has to kind of rebuild. And so I've experienced that many times in my life. You know, I came from parents who were teachers who were, you know, um, you know, successful, but we had mental health issues, you know, alcoholism in our family, you know, um, people who had schizophrenia, you know, in our family. And so that, you know, we had achieved these things, you know, um, it was tough. But I know that even though you might come from a mixed background where you have some things going good for you and other things that are a little harder, um, and even in my own life as as a parent, you know, it's been a challenge. But I always know that you know I can be Marcus Aurelius, you know, and make the you know that that proclamation that I will come back and I will retain and I will do what I need to do for my family and my kids. And so, if you have that passion, if you have that love for family, community, and for making the folks and your kids better, I think that's the biggest thing. And, you know, when you count out kids, um, you should never do that because when you do that, you end up realizing that you are missing out on big opportunities for kids who could do amazing things in the world. Um, and so I try never to count anyone out. And I, and I just hope that um, you would give me an opportunity to support you and give all my love and passion and support um, to your students and be a voice for the Latino um, folks, folks who don't speak, you know, English as their first language, to folks who, you know, at one point didn't do so great financially and had to build themselves up, um, to the teen parent, and then to the, I guess, what you would call regular age parent, now that my daughter, um, you know, I had her a little bit later in life. Um, so I have that big gap. But, um, you know, anything that's happened, any issue I've had in life, I've, I've always found a way to problem solve, um, along with my husband of, we're going to be 20 years we've been married, we met in high school. Um, so no matter what, I think the great thing about that Gladiator movie is that we keep moving forward and we believe ourselves and we overcome despite our circumstances. All right. Well, in the words of Russell Crowe, we are entertained. <laughs> and, and you'll be happy to know that they're actually working on a, a second Gladiator movie. So a couple years, maybe that'll come out. All right. Ms. Mumford, what is your favorite movie and why? So I, I'm sorry, you can say book. I struggled with, do I want to say something that's going to make me sound really smart and thoughtful, or do I want to be honest? And I landed on honest. My favorite movie is Armageddon. It makes you laugh. It makes you cry. It makes you think. It was a big thing in my family when I was growing up. So I kind of like imprinted on it. And it just makes me feel like this very nostalgic, happy way Um I, my husband will not watch it with me. He has never watched it with me all the way through. And we've been together eight years because after about 25 minutes, he's really tired of me quoting every single line and no longer wants to continue watching the film. And so that is my favorite, my favorite movie. My favorite book is called A Little Life. I read it recently. We'll not go into what it's about, but it is, um, it will break you as a person, but it is totally worth it. And I just want to tout it because I think everyone should go read that book. It's absolutely life changing. Armageddon is the movie with Bruce Willis. Yep, sure yeah, is. Okay. Yeah, okay. That sure. is a good best one. <laughs> that year it was um, best picture. That year was Shakespeare and Love, which I guess is you know much better, better like cinematic event than Armageddon. But I disagree. S Saving Private Ryan also came out the same year. It also did not win best picture. People were down. Yeah, that's considered a major upset to this day. Okay. So that brings us to our final three minutes. We'll let you each make a closing statement. Steve, if you want to set the clock. <laughs> uh, and why don't we start with uh, Ms. Mumford? You got three more minutes, but you don't have to use it all, but three minutes just to wrap up. Or if there's something that 
didn't come up during the course of questions that you want to emphasize or bring to our attention, uh, it's the floor is yours. Awesome. So just first and foremost, thank you again to the board for hosting this event um, and to uh, Dr. Burroughs, and thank you to everyone from the public who has joined us. I know that everyone's, you know, you're making dinner for kids, you're carting them to and from soccer practice and taking the time to become an engaged and, and educated member of your community on this election is, is a big commitment. So I appreciate that. If there's anyone that's watching it now or anyone that watches it later on YouTube, again, that has any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, because I'm really smart, my phone number is on my organization's webpage. It's as my personal phone number is also my work number. So I'm a super accessible individual. Uh, feel free to text me, shoot me an email at mumford for appo at gmail.com and we can find some time to get coffee. Uh, we are currently uh, in my day job working to change the name of our organization from Delaware Can to Delaware Kids Can. And I think that's just really embodies as, as well, just who I am as a person. Kids can, they need us to give them the tools and the opportunities, but every kid can learn. And I, sorry, I really just love that that's one of the values of the Epiquinimic School Board is that we're always doing the best for the kids because that's really why we should all be here. And that's absolutely why I am here because I believe in the students in Epiquinimic and I want to continue uh, to make their lives and their educational experience better. All right, well, thank you very much, Ms. Asino. I um, also am really grateful for this time. Um, I was super nervous coming here and, and talking um, so officially. Um, I've been someone who's always promoted, you know, for others and supported others. So I feel a little bit awkward talking about, you know, what I can do and how I can support, um, especially since this district does and has done so many great things for my daughter. And I want to be able to give back um, to the district that gave us so much, you know, we just uh, being able to pick out of the good high schools and the, the, the teachers that are at AG Water who really care. Um, it's just such an amazing experience. You know, um, COVID hit us hard. You know, my daughter had to do sixth grade, you know, totally virtually, fifth grade as well. Um, and I just remember how mental health just really affected my family and really affected, you know, my kids and all the kids around her. Um, who've had disabilities and learning and, you know, in my own family, we've had that um, just really struggled. And so just know that I'm the kind of person who is an apparent who knows what it is to struggle through. And I want to find ways to support everyone who um, wants their kids to be successful. You know, whether you have a lot of money, a little money, whether you have a lot of time or a little bit of time, um, you know, as parents, as families, we want to be able to give our kids everything. And sometimes it's tough to do that. Um, and so just know that if I am on school board, that I'm going to be thinking about, okay, what is a better way that I can support parents so they can support kids? And what other things can we do that would support kids so that we don't have to spend a lot of money, but we can use our assets and resources? Um, I'm a realist. I know that the budget is tight. And so for being a nonprofit, I know what it is to work with a small budget. So I'm willing and committed to take a little bit and make a lot out of it. So, you know, I ask for your vote if you, um, I humbly would accept it if you did that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both for uh, being here tonight. Thank you both for throwing your hat in the ring. Um, it is very, um, it's a very brave thing to file to run for office and put your name on the ballot. And when you go in on April 23rd and are standing at the voting machine and your name is there, that takes a, it takes nerve, um, but it's a good thing. And, and so the, the school board thanks you both uh, for, for indicating uh, your desire uh, to serve. And, and I will say, I thought you were both um, did a very nice job answering the questions. Both seem enthusiastic, qualified, and all the things that we look for in board members. And, and I'll just conclude by saying that if either of you have any questions of us after tonight, 
you know, we're all very uh, accessible, accessible. And I know Toshiba is very accessible. And those of us who couldn't be here tonight are, are very uh, accessible as well. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or concerns after tonight. And uh, otherwise, uh, the election is May 14th. There's another election, though, that I need to mention that happens before uh, May 14th. There's this other thing that's happening on April 23rd. Um, so please uh, turn out and vote yes for that. I, we have a whole pitch, and Matt and I have done it many times now. We could probably do it from memory, but uh, that would make the meeting go uh, even longer. Uh, for the record, uh, upcoming meetings, the Financial Advisory Committee is meeting uh, Tuesday, March 26th in the Finance Conference Room down in the uh, Tony Marchio Administrative Building. Our next regular board meeting is going to be Tuesday, April 9th uh, here at 7 o'clock. And then we're going to have a workshop on the 23rd uh, here in uh, these chambers as well uh, while we wait for the successful referendum results. So again, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to our two candidates, both for being here, but more importantly, for being willing to serve. And, you know, it's a shame that that uh, only one person can can be elected. And thank you, everybody else who who attended in person as well. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>